teachers back uh, from uh, recess yesterday. So we will continue on the agenda. I would like to start with uh, the Vice Speaker's Bill, number 43-32. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to move the Bill 43-32 COR as substituted by the Committee on Guam U.S. Military Relocation, Homeland Security, Veterans Affairs, and Judiciary be placed to the third reading file, and I'd last ask for a opportunity to, uh, to speak on the bill. I may proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. First, I'd like to thank the uh, good chairman for expediting the hearing on this. This is a very important issue. Um, I don't know how many of you get the joint region newspaper that comes out every Friday, but um, earlier this year, actually it was last month, um, for two successive Fridays, the, that newspaper, which is published by Joint Me Region Marianas, uh, did an article about problems that they're having with spice. And um, I called in the Attorney General, the U.S. Attorney, the DEA agent, uh, resident agent, to discuss with them how we can address this issue. And um, we have been trying to address this issue. First, it was addressed by our good uh, colleague who's... Um, no longer with us, Senator Frank Bloss, he brought this to the legislature's attention about four years ago. And subsequent to that, we've been trying to amend it. And as you can see in the legislation, in trying to figure out this thing called SPICE, be between he and I and the DEA, we've added um, 42 compounds. Um, that we thought can and should be included or, or are, are part of or comprise this thing called SPICE. And um, before I continue, I'd also like to give special thanks to Ms. Robigo and Ms. Duenas uh, from Public Health and Social Services who, who went through and made sure that the compound scientific names were correctly spelled in this because I didn't want any case to be thrown out because we had misspelled the compound. Anyway, um, as you can see on page two and three and four, that there are there were 43 compounds that uh, we had been adding to this to try to make sure that uh, every time we thought that the first 15 compounds would be enough, they added the um, the, the spice makers would use five or six new ones. So we kept adding and adding and adding. And um, we kept getting outsmarted. And so finally, we were told to look at uh, Colorado. And Colorado did one thing. It didn't even have a scientific name. On page four of the bill, item 44, besides all the 43 other scientific components that are listed there, is a very simple any synthetic cat cannabinoid. Cannab cannabinoid. Boy. Cannabinoid. And um, on page one, we define what this synthetic cannabinoid is. It's any chemical compound that is synthetically chem synthesized and either has been demonstrated to have binding activity at one or more cannabinoid receptors, or two, is a chemical analog or isomer of a compound that has been demonstrated to have a binding activity at one or more cannabinoid receptors. What that uh, translates to, Madam Speaker, is that anything that can be, is, and has the effect of a cannab cannabinoid is a synthetic cannabinoid and is one of the now 44 uh, um, items that if included in this herb that is smoked 
or however it's in, ingested, um, that it is considered to be spice and would be uh, violative of the law and is, um, is part of the Schedule I controlled substance. The other amendment that here is to remove uh, the top of line, page two, that it's a temporary listing of substances subject to emergency scheduling. It, this is now, has been adopted by DEA, uh, FDA, and, and we are doing that with our legislation here also. So Madam Speaker, the sh long and short of it is, is that this has been a, an attempt by Senator Frank Bloss, myself, and, and um, thankfully this legislature that has joined us in this fight of trying to figure out ways to, to stem this um, or address this issue. Um, and unfortunately uh, is being utilized by children in our schools because it does not show up in, on test. Um, it has the effect of being able to make people high like um, marijuana, but you could pee until the cows come home and there it would not show up on any test. Um, and so uh, the court has been having problems where their, their parolees, I mean their probationists are coming in looking obviously high, but when they're, when they're tested, it comes out negative on all, on, all, on all grounds because there hasn't been um, developed a test to be able to de de detect these, um, the use of, of, of spice. The military has been having that same problem is that the uh, use of, the, um, of spice was a way of getting around being tested and being found positive for marijuana. And so um, I'm hoping that my colleagues will continue the fight that was started by Senator Frank Bloss and um, the um, flag I've picked up from him and continue to, to carry for, for the community. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, you will assist and my colleagues will assist in passing this piece of legislation to hopefully finally close this circle because every, we, it seems like we're chasing our tail around. And I think with this one, I may have snapped my tail and closed that circle and hopefully um, caught, the, caught the person in, in, or at least the people that are involved in this. So I thank again the good chairman for the expedited hearing on this and um, I'm hoping that my colleagues will assist in, in the, in the uh, uh, passage of this legislation. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You're welcome. On the motion, recognize Senator Frank Ogden. My name is Jesus, Madam Speaker, and good morning to you and, and our colleagues. Madam Speaker, I'd like to stand in support of this legislation, and I'll make it fairly brief. Is I think that the good sponsor, the Vice Speaker, certainly highlighted the concerns with regards to having to perhaps indirectly highlight the concerns about having to come back to this body and repeatedly address some of these issues. But I want to focus in on some of the effects. When you're talking about it causes nausea and panic attacks to our, our youth, in many cases, most of them are our youth utilizing these substances. And then you ask yourself the question, why do we need to continue to come back to this table or to this August body? And amend the law, now it's being expanded to be inclusive in the future, and, and I think that that's an excellent move on the sponsor, but, you know, Madam Speaker, it really boils down to ensuring that at their most impressionable age or ages, that our youth understand that the, their leaders in this community is going to continue to look out for their welfare and for their concern. And it really boils down to that. By virtue of using this, the, the sponsor of the legislation highlighted that some of the effects are even more potent than marijuana. And that being the case, I think we need to share the message also with a lot of our children and on our, a lot of our youth who have the tendency or who have had the tendency to use some of these substances that is just not good for you. It's not healthy, it's not right, and by virtue of making it an illegal substance, certainly we certainly hope that this would discourage them 
and many of others, our other youth out there in the community from using some of these substances. So, Madam Speaker, I stand in complete support of this legislation. I commend the sponsor and the previous sponsors of similar legislation in prior legislatures, my primo, Senator Frank Bloss, for taking on this mantle because it's really leaning forward and recognizing that there are ever-changing times and regardless as to some of the decisions that we make, yes, some of our youth and some people out there in the community can become more creative, but guess what? Every single time that you try to improve upon the whole process in terms of trying to get high, you're gonna have leaders such as the sponsor of this legislation stepping forward and saying, enough is enough. We need to take, make sure that this community continues to remain safe and healthy for all of our residents. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I stand in support of the proposal. Welcome. On the motion, recognize Senator Duenas. Good morning, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to rise in full support of this measure, Bill 4332. You know, Madam Speaker, not only, of course, my good friend and colleague, uh, Senator Frank Bloss, and, and also the Vice Speaker in their, in their efforts teaming up on, on this issue, uh, but just to kind of expound at this point on the interactions prior to serving in this legislature that I've had with the good vice speaker over the years. Of all the wonderful things that he's done throughout his career, I admire him most for his constant advocacy for the protection of our children. I shared in his frustration and even my good friend and colleague, Senator Frank Bloss Jr.'s frustration of every time they thought that they arrived at a solution, these, and this is nationwide, Madam Speaker, these, I don't even know how to characterize them because they're so evil as far as I'm concerned, creating synthetic drugs that, that have the kind of effect on our, on our people, much less, of course, our children. But as the good vice speaker just uh, said in, uh, before he retired, the chasing of the tail. And I think in this bill, he has finally accomplished uh, the goal and of, of, of stopping to have to worry about being ahead of or at least alongside of these evildoers that would you know, perpetrate against our people. When I say my interaction with the good vice speaker as the Director of the Department of Youth Affairs, just seeing his work at Sanctuary and, and, and the things that, and the compassion that he put in to the efforts in trying to help these young people, especially those in most need, he saw as much as I saw during the time, and, and, and thankfully now with the evolution of the Juvenile Drug Court, the struggles that our young people get into when they experiment with substances, alcohol, uh, other illicit drugs. And when they're finally at the end of their rope and get into the juvenile justice system and they're afforded the opportunity to participate in drug court, at least, Madam Speaker, at least, when they're testing, if they test positive for a substance, marijuana, alcohol, perhaps methamphetamines, you can address that issue. And while it's terrible and there's sanctions and you keep trying to move forward and, you know, a lot of young people have graduated and, and, and have wonderful full lives after going through this program. But it is these kind of things, Madam Speaker, that really cause a worse problem, as the Vice Speaker just said, because in their desperation through addiction, they will seek to find ways to beat the system. And... We've seen that even with butane. We've had to pass laws on, on, on how to control even, even that distribution and, and marketability. So in closing, Madam Speaker, I just, I, I, can't, I can't say how much I support and applaud the efforts here, simply because unless you see a young person devastated by trying to mask and go outside of substances that they're abusing, that at least have some sort of control or we can treat, and some even losing their lives because of their capacity afterwards to function because of how evil 
these synthetic drugs are and the unknown effects. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost equivalent to just handing out pharmaceuticals, Madam Speaker. You know, that doctors control because they have to monitor side effects. So it cannot be underscored the importance of this legislation to ensure that we can shut down and hold liable those who would try to make a buck and not take into consideration whatsoever the damage that they will do, will do, because that's what happens when people use these synthetic forms of drugs. It's unconscionable, and I, I thank you once again, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to speak on this, and most certainly we'll be voting in the affirmative for this piece of legislation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, is there anyone else who would like to speak? There being none, so in the motion then to send Bill 43-32 to the third reading file without any objection, so ordered. I'd like to recognize Senator Yamashita and Bill number 23-32. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I ask that Bill Number 23-32 COR, as amended by the Committee on Municipal Affairs, Tourism, Housing, and Haganea Restoration and Redevelopment Authority, be placed in the third reading file, and I ask to be able to speak on it. Please, sir, continue. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this is the third time that I stand in front of this body uh, to discuss th um, this particular measure, an act to place the former Agate Fire Station under the administrative jurisdiction of the Mayor's Office of Agate by amending item one, a subsection 40113B of chapter 40, title five, Guam code annotated. Um, it's not typically my nature, but I'm actually gonna read uh, a prepared document. Madam Speaker, uh, between June and December 2012, the Guam Fire Department and Agate <laughs> Mayor's Office attempted to execute a memorandum agreement to allow full use of the building and premises of the old Agate Fire Station. A draft MOA was sent to the governor's then legal counsel, Maria Senzon, who advised the Guam Fire Department and the mayor that legislative action was needed for the transfer. On September 28, 2012, at the request of Mayor Carol Tayama, Bill 518 was introduced by myself to place the old Agate Fire Station under the Agate Mayor's administrative jurisdiction. The mayor was concerned about safety and working environment in the Agate Mayor's office because of severe termite infestation. The mayor informed me that she wanted to move into the old fire station and form a community partnership with Sanctuary Incorporated to allow them to use the current mayor's office as a satellite for all southern uh, villages. And Sanctuary's status as a nonprofit organization <laughs> would allow it to take advantage of grants to rehabilitate the mayor's office. October 29, 2012, a public hearing was held on Bill 518 testimony was provided, uh, no private citizen stepped forward to oppose the bill or claim land ownership. November 2012, the bill was placed on session agenda and discussed, and I requested it be referred back to the committee to address concerns about whether the land belonged to the Tomorrow Land Trust Commission, which was then raised by some of us in the, in the hall. On December 6, 2013, the family's first staff met with Director Moffness, who is the Director of Land Management, who indicated that he was supportive of the intent to transfer the firehouse under the Agate Mayor's jurisdiction to, in order to allow Sanctuary to utilize the Mayor's office to serve Southern families. Research with the Department of Land Management uh, staff with the consent of Director Moffness, who was briefed on the bill, determined that the land remained listed in the Government Guam inventory and was not privately owned. January 25, 2013, a bill, Bill 23 was introduced, 32nd Guam Legislature, February 13, 2013, a public hearing was held, and testimony was again provided in support, and at that time, again, there was no formal um, representation that this belonged to a family. February 2013, the bill was placed on session agenda, and during this discussion, I again requested that it referred back to the second reading file because other senators, including yourself, um, uh, Madam Speaker, informed me that there was a family claiming ownership. February 22nd, 2013, Stephanie Flores, Committee on Municipal Affairs, Tourism, Housing, and Gutnia Restoration Development Authority, 
to which this bill was referred to, contacted, and I'm going to go ahead. I had been uh, previously said not to name any families, but because the family has uh, provided you uh, documents, and these documents have been copied and um, uh, as a courtesy given to every senator, uh, I will now name the family. Um, contacted Mr. Ken Paris, who is the, who's the family planning ownership. He stated that land in question was part of Civil Case 5-49, filed in District Court of Guam, with copy provided to Ancestral Lands Commission. Mr. Paris stated that the case deals with more than just the agate property in question, and it deals with the condemnation of the property for Navy sta Naval Station, Big Navy. February 22nd, no, February 26, 2013, we sent additional requests to the Department of Land Management to do further research on the lot in question. On the 28th of February in 2013, we met with Senator Tina Rose Munia Barnes, Mayor Tayama, Minority Legal Counsel uh, Senator Espaldin, and Senator Tina Mose, Rose Munia Barnes actually called Mr. Paris at that time, who said the family would provide us the documents to show that they do indeed own this property. On February 28th, sen uh, we, uh, Senator uh, Mayor Tayama, Retrieved documents to the Department of Land Management, including the map, the abstract tile, the warranty deeds, the copy of the District Court, a Guam Civil Case 5-49, and those documents were all submitted to the Committee on Rules, as requested and as needs to be, as supplements to the Committee Report by the Municipal Affairs Committee. The land did belong to the Navy government in the 1940s. It was transferred back to the Gov Guam in 1950. In February 1970, it was recorded. It was a warranty deed. Land was purchased by Juana Maria Anderson. In April 1970, it uh, was recorded the warranty deed. The land was sold to Cavill Financial Corporation by Juan and Maria Anderson. And in August 1979, it was recorded that the warranty deed land sold to Government of Guam by Cavill Financial Corporation. Civil Case 5-49, the decree states that Pedro Borja Pangilinan, Mr. Paris's grandfather, was awarded Lot 39-A Sumai Tract 551. It does not reference Lot 443, Part 1-2, New-1, hyphen the former Agate Fire Station, which is the lot that we are speaking about. Additionally, the original lot number is 163, but again, this lot number is not mentioned at all in Civil Case Number 5-49. Lot 443, Part 1-2, New-1, where the former Agate Station is located, housed GPD and GFD somewhere around 1980s, according to Lieutenant Edward Artero, GFD Fire Chief's aide, the PIO who was assigned to work on this memorandum of agreement a couple years ago. GPD vacated when Southern Police Precinct was built off Erskine Drive in Agate. GFD continued to use the land until 2010 when the new Agate Fire Station was built near GPD Southern Precinct. March 20th, 2013, the, municipal, the Legislative Municipal Affairs Committee um, had not received the documents uh, about this land from the family. And then March 22, 2013, I sent correspondence myself to Mr. Ken Paris about his concerns and about how he and I are, are not communicating. March 25th, he received, he sent you a letter, Madam Speaker, of which copies were given to uh, every senator. And he again sent another email, which again, copies have been shared with every single senator, and it was through an uh, email. And he stated his concerns again about Bill 23, stating he is not opposed to giving the Agate Mayor's Office administrative control of the old Agate fireplace, but they will not relinquish or give up of their claim to the property. And if you read that email, it says, so long as it is recognized in 2332, we will not object in granting administrative control of the fire station to Mayor Tayama, in fact, our family will probably prefer that to simply letting the fire station lay idle and subject to vandalism. Items to consider. The intent of this bill is not to prevent or block the family or any individual from finding claims to the property. The purpose of the bill is to assist Agate Mayor's office find a new office and allow them to partner sanctuary so that the nonprofit organization can better serve Guam's families in southern villages. The property is going to remain in the Gov Guam inventory all that is being transferred is administrative control. And again, this will not affect the claim of the family. Their claims will still be as to the government of Guam. The improvements to the property, when, when and if, well, if and when, the mayor moves into the building, will actually benefit the family uh, as they become successful in their claims against the government. If the argument is that the property goes into the Chamorro Land Trust inventory as ancestral land status because GFD vacated it, as per Title I GCA Division II, Chapter 75, 
subsection 75104 Chamar Land Trust, that same law states in subsection 75107 that the Chamar Land Trust is authorized to lease land for 21 years to public utility companies or corporations as telephone lines, electric power, light lines, gas mains, and the like. And the commission is also authorized to grant licenses for lots within a village in which lands are leased under provisions of the section two, number one, churches, hospitals, public schools, post offices, and other improvements for public purposes. Furthermore, subsection 75107 states that upon direction by statute from the legislature, the commission shall release to the department any unleased available land designated for a public purpose. Such land will no longer be considered to be tomorrow homelands. And I have a listing of the people who've worked, because I think some folks get the sense that I went in and did this research myself, and you know, who am I? Oh, hi, Mr. Speaker. And so, <laughs> I didn't see that switch. And so, um, I would want to actually go on record and say who, uh, who helped, because while I have very dedicated, we are four strong in this office, we're very dedicated workers, we do not have research backgrounds in land, the people do who did help us were. Monte Moffness, Director of Director Land Management, Eileen Chargloff, Land Agent 2, Chamorro Land Trust, Andrew Santos, Deputy Civil, Civil Registrar, Department of Land Management, Ernest Santos, Land Agent Supervisor, Marvin Kitago Aguilar, our Chief Planner, Department of Land Management, the Mayor herself, GFD Artero, uh, GFD Joey Nicholas, Mike Paris, Assistant at the Office of the Governor. And so there are um, at least two amendments that I would like to offer, and I do know that in speaking with some of us, that we want to consider actually addressing the concern of Mr. Paris in his last email to Madam Speaker, at which some of us were copied, to, to do that. And I can see that uh, as Madam Speaker came to, into the floor that she's probably going to be addressing that. So, um, Mr. Speaker, my first amendment would be on page two, on line six. It's lot number 443, part 1-2, new, R-1. The R is not needed. That was a typo, typing error. So it's really lot number 443, part 1-2, new-1. And so it, as we drilled down in the data, um, the land people helping us said they made a mistake by putting that capital R in there. That's, that's not a needed. All right, that, that amendment too. It's a Technical amendment will be corrected for the title. Thank you. No objection. And then my second amendment is um, I passed it out on page two. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. On page two, um, I would like to add a number two, which would go after line 15. And it, that number two would read, um, and this was a, an issue raised, I don't know which session it was. I don't know if it was um, last session or in last term. Uh, this was a concern, and so I would like to proffer this as an amendment. And an addition, on page 16, number two, a memorandum of agreement shall be signed by the Agate Mayor and any organization utilizing the existing Agate Mayor's office located at the Agate Community Center Complex, addressing terms and conditions to include releasing the government from liability. And that's been passed out, and I believe the clerks have it. On the um, amendment proposed by Senator Yamashita, all those who wish to be heard on the amendment? No There's no objection. Before I forget uh, Senator Yamashita, I've just been informed by the clerk that anything that you want, or at least that you've been reading from, that you would like to have placed in the legislative journal, um, you can submit it to her. The letters, the, what this, your, 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 the text of your speech, whatever you want to, to uh, complete the journal, um, you're more than welcome to submit it to her so that she can include it into the journal to make that complete. Because you were reading pretty fast. So, uh, you're invited to do that, and uh, thank you. Any anybody else wish to speak on the on the motion? Okay, um, Madam Legislative Secretary. 
My name is Jesus. Mr. Speaker, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and rise in support of this bill number 23-32COR. And as the good author of the legislation has given me the opportunity to be her co-sponsor, I want to just extend my uncle in the seat to us, Masi, because uh, truly when it comes to working closely with the mayors and in giving them the resources they need uh, to empower them to work closely with their village residents, I want to say that uh, working closely with her on this bill uh, as oversight chair in municipal affairs, uh, I want to say that we did a lot of work together. We worked closely with the government agencies. We also had talkings with the non-private, uh, um, uh, non-profit organizations who share an interest on wanting to work closely with the Agate Mayor's Office. Um, Mr. Speaker, this bill 23-30 uh, through 32 uh, does transfer administrative control only to the um, Agate Mayor's Office. Uh, the property, I want to note, the property will remain in the government's, uh, the government of Guam's inventory. Uh, any existing potential claims against the government can still be made. I uh, want to note that for the record. Uh, I want to also share that uh, we respect all uh, original landowners and encourage them to pursue all remedies available to them. Uh, However, uh, this does not mean that this property should remain idle and deteriorate, that the property uh, will cost more to repair if we wait until all potential claims are, are fully pushed. Uh, I say that for the record, uh, Mr. Speaker, is because I respect um, and believe that uh, if there's any original landowners out there and they feel that they have a claim to this, then, then please, by all means, we respect the fact for them to pursue their claim further. Uh, again, uh, this property will go under the administrative control of the mayors, but the property remains within the government of Guam. The same government of Guam, the same Team Guam uh, approach, and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the good author for really working hard uh, with our office to follow through and to do the research on the uh, property uh, title research with land management, but even taking a step further into trying to gather any and all information uh, from others within the village and those uh, within the government of Guam agencies to make sure that we were on track in giving this administrative control over uh, to the mayor, the good mayor of Agate, Mayor Carol Tayama. So uh, in that effort, I want to thank her uh, hard uh, work and her due diligence uh, uh, Senator Eileen has done to um, make sure that the residents of Agate and the mayor of Agate uh, will soon um, have a place where they can call home that's not in disrepair. And uh, again, there's a lot of hard work that needs to be done, but uh, they're willing to step up to the challenge and help renovate, refurbish, and work closely with the residents of Agat. So I, I stand in full support. I thank her again for giving me the opportunity to speak, and I just want to say it's good to be home in Guam warm weather. Sainamasi. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Um, any other senator wish to be heard on the bill? Madam Speaker, you're recognized. Any other senator after the speaker who wishes to be heard? Madam Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to um, acknowledge, of course, and recognize uh, the author of this uh, legislation who has thoroughly uh, done um, an extensive research uh, to get us uh, to this point. And I'm not going to go through all the work that um, she had done uh, to be able then to clarify us and then to clarify everything to get us um, here. Uh, I'd like to um, rec read a, a letter uh, from a family member, and I would like to have this also included in the journal. And it is uh, from at least the, uh, one family uh, representative uh, from Joaquin Paris, and it reads, Madam Speaker, I'm attaching my final signed letter on Bill 23-32. Please disregard the earlier letter, which was not signed. 
I apologize for the lateness of this letter, but I have to clarify matters with family members. As I noted earlier, I am not adverse to Mayor Tayama moving her office to the fire station. In fact, the fire station would be well served as she would take care of it. I applaud Sanctuary for wanting to open a satellite unit in Agate, as the youth of the South will be well served by their presence. However, my family wants it understood that we will not relinquish or give up our claim and contention that property along that area from the present mayor's office to the Southern Sewer Treatment Plant belong to Christina Sablan Pangilinan, widow of Pedro Borja Pangilinan, who died in 1935, that the property was included in the declaration of taking District Court Case Number 5-49. So long as this is recognized in 23-32, we would not object to granting administrative control of the fire station to Mayor Tayama. In fact, our family will probably prefer that to simply letting the fire station lay idle and subject to vandalism. Sincerely, Ken Paris. So as a result of all the work that's been done and the lengthy letter that uh, the author had read earlier, I would like to, to make an amendment on section three and to add a new number two, and it should read. <coughs> Nothing. Uh, th there is already a number two. There is? What's the number two? Uh, she added the lease, so this would oh. be a three. Okay, so a three, thank you. So it would be a new three under section two. And it would read, nothing herein is intended to relinquish any rights or remedies available to the families pursuant to the declaration of taking district court case number 5-49. On the um, WAMPAD amendment, any senator wish to be heard? No Any objection no. to the amendment? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Anybody else wish to be heard on the um, main motion? If not, uh, Senator Yamashita, you recognize to close. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Madam Speaker. Um, I, I certainly continue to always learn a lot, and I really appreciate the collective efforts. I always think it's really important to always work together and to move forward, and I think this measure really is going to help uh, the southern part of our island and the whole island because now perhaps the fire station would get a facelift. So I thank everyone for their intelligence, and I ask everyone um, to please consider supporting this measure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the motion to send the bill down to the voting file, carrying no objection. I'd like to recognize uh, Senator Tina Munya Barnes on Bill Number 43-32. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Thank you for giving me uh, your uh, glasses. <laughs> My eyes are twitching right now. But, Madam Speaker, I move that 46-32 LS be moved to the third reading. And if I can uh, briefly uh, speak on this bill, which so is an act to amend a, uh, subsection, a subsection C and subsection H of Article 1, Chapter 10, Title 5, Guam Code Annotated, relative to the right of inspection. And it's, Can I not, speak? it's not a substituted version? It's no. Just, you may not that I know of. Yes. It's not. Okay. Um, Madam Speaker, uh, uh, this bill is straightforward. Uh, the only thing we are seeking uh, to change is to keep private... Uh, information is to keep private information private home addresses 
age, home telephone numbers, uh, that they be held private. Uh, this bill, uh, the legislative intent, finds that there exists an inconsistency in the laws governing the disclosure of information re related to public employees and officials with respect to uh, private personal information. Um, it was recognized that no public uh, policy is served by releasing an employee's age and mailing address and that the amendment would protect individuals from unwanted visitors mail, harassment, and stalkers. And uh, this body uh, further finds that due to the rise in identity theft, there exists sound policy and justification for the continued pr protection of private personal information of public servants, and that such can be done without compromising the objectives of transparency. I know that when we talked with the executive branch on this issue that they too uh, wanted to see this uh, bill, uh, this legislation move forward, and I ask that my colleagues help me um, support this measure, as again, uh, this bill is straightforward, and we're asking that, uh, we are only asking to change is to keep private information private, like home addresses, age, home telephone numbers, and that they be made private. Uh, Sina Masi for giving me the opportunity to speak on this bill. On the motion, there being none, so on the motion then to send 46-32 to the third reading file without any objections, so ordered. Resolution number 58-32, I recognize Senator Rodriguez. Thank you and good morning, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I move to place resolution 58 Dash 32, as amended by the author in a third reading, and um, be allowed to briefly speak on it. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, um, Resolution 58 is pretty simple. Um, it requests the Governor of Guam to designate, pursuant to Executive Order, Senia, a self-advocate in action, as a state self-advocacy organization of Guam. Uh, Madam Speaker, the Guam Developmental Disabilities Council approached me in um, and ask that we consider in a substantial resolution, substantive resolution, um, requesting the governor of Guam designating Senia as the self-advocacy um, state, state um, self-advocacy state organization on Guam. Uh, the GDDC, Madam Speaker, uh, serves as a re resource to individuals with disabilities and their families who are in need of assistance to access community service individualized support and other forms of assistance that promote self-determination, independence, productivity, and integration and inclusion in all facets of community life. Madam Speaker, currently there is no existing self-advocacy group in Guam. The, GD, the GDDDC recommended and recommends the self-advocate in action, Senia, to serve as the state self-advocacy organization of Guam. And um, the, the, the council describes Senia as a cross-disability organization that promotes self-advocacy for persons with all types of disabilities with the leadership of its own members. And we had, um, you hosted, Madam Speaker, a informational um, roundtable presentation a few weeks ago, and we've heard the, um, the work that Senia is undertaking in the community and what positive changes it's, it's bringing. And so we're, we're asking this resolution just um, uh, puts it on record and asks the governor of Guam to designate them as the state self-advocacy group of our, of our island. And um, with that, Madam Speaker, I'd like to move to place um, Senator Aline Yamashita and yourself as co-sponsors of the, and also Senator Tina Rose Munya Barnes as co-sponsors of this resolution. No objection on the amendment, no objection, so order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the motions, anyone who would like to speak? Senator Yamashita, you're recognized, and Senator Byrne. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, it was most heartwarming to be at that legislative awareness session, and I, it is to have these people come together and to see how humble they are, how honest they are, how smart they are, and how funny they are. 
is really a renewal of, um, of being a human being. Uh, I was at the GSAC conference last Saturday, and they're learning the latest in technology. They're learning where they can get work and how they can better take care of themselves. And you know, what drives what they're able to do, of course, is transportation. So the buses, they don't come or they come late, that really impacts. But such a group, Senia, they can now come together even stronger and advocate for stuff like transportation, housing, recreation, sidewalks, ramps, not going to the second floor through the service entry, which is what many of us have to do when we're in a wheelchair. And so um, it is with full support that I stand in, uh, for resolution number 58-32, and I thank um, Senator Rodriguez for, for working on this. There is one technical error on page two, line 21, uh, the letter C for inadvocacy, just a spelling, self-advocacy. Now, thank you, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, Senator Munya Barnes, you're recognized. Senator Mossy Tatlu, uh, Speaker Wampat, for giving me the opportunity to speak and rise in support of this resolution. Um, as we look at what this organization of senior does, um, and its um, nonprofit, charitable, uh, and educational organizations, which consists of individuals with all types of disabilities and their families, um, the word senior alone. Uh, for us, our tomorrow meaning is can do or it is possible. And with the efforts and the purpose of this um, group, um, it is to promote the self-advocacy and self-determination for all persons with disabilities and their families by assisting, educating, forming alliances, participating together to further strengthen efforts to accomplish individual goals to improve one's quality of life, to experience self-determination, and to choose and decide for oneself, to speak up, to empower oneself, to promote and protect one's dignity, and to educate each other's members of the community and public servants on the issues that are important to them. I also want to say, Madam Speaker, that they want to continue to educate, train, and empower individuals with disabilities, with self-advocacy and self-determination, knowledge, tools, and skills needed to enhance their lives. And when we look at this group and we look at resolutions like this to support the community, I want to say it, it's a win-win. And I thank the good author of the resolution for initiating this. I thank him for giving me the opportunity to speak in support of this, and I just want to say this is a good thing for all persons with disabilities. Having come from that arena many, working with that arena many years ago for a period of eight years, I want to say that our continued efforts as a policy maker to work closely uh, with this organization, um, we will continue to share our commitment in moving forward for their advocacy. So. Thank you again for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak in support of this resolution, and thanks, Senator Rodriguez, for pushing uh, this forward. Senator Masi. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, uh, Senator McCready. Oh, uh, Sen Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would like to um, commend the author, uh, the good Senator Rodriguez, for the foresight and the leadership in, in allowing uh, persons with disabilities a voice. And uh, as I said at the round table we had a few weeks ago, the disabled community right now has a lot of momentum going for them. And I think uh, it's up to us as a body and with, with resolutions such as 5832, we help them with their momentum in moving forward and we help them and we help the community and we help their families educate them that, it, that these disabled people are absolutely entitled to the same things that we are entitled to. And as I said in the uh, 
uh, the round table that we were at, some of the best employees that I had were, were of, of disabled uh, persons. And one of my best employees was legally blind. So I, I, once again, I, I thank the author, and I can't thank him enough. And I think we, we need to, as for lack of a better term, put the, the, the pedal to the metal, and we need to keep advocating uh, for the people, persons with disabilities. And we need to, um, we need to support these people to their absolute entitlement. So thank you to the, to the author, and uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on this, Madam Speaker. You're welcome, Senator. On the motion, is there anybody else who would like to speak on it? There being none, Senator Rodriguez, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, before I close, I'd like to also move um, to add Senator McCready and Senator Limtiaka, who are both also at the round table as co-sponsors of this resolution. On the, mo on the amendment, no objection, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I want to thank my colleagues for rising in support of this resolution. If, if you were, were there, you've, um, you were watching the round table, you saw the, the passion that these individuals have in, in, in um, making positive contribution to our community despite the challenges they face. I want to congratulate, of course, the, the chair, um, Lynn, Lynn Tidenko, and her, and her team there who really work very hard in putting um, together uh, the work that they do um, with the group. And I want to invite my colleagues, our colleagues, Madam Speaker, and the people of Guam, this coming Saturday, the Guam, uh, the GG, GDDC is having a family day picnic at the Ipal Beach Park. It starts at 11.30 and it's a, a good time to bring the family. It's a time to start the um, Easter holiday season as well. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Welcome, Senators. On the motion to send resolution 58-32 to the third reading file without any objections, so ordered. <laughs> we, we have uh, one more bill, but I understand that copies are being made. Uh, you wanted to speak? No, I want to go back to the motion. Oh, okay. So, um, yes, can you make the, the motion then, the procedural uh, motion? Yes, Madam Speaker, I um, I like to ask that we move back to um, motions uh, for the purpose of adding to the agenda the appointments of uh, Ms. Sandra F. Santos and Glenn A. Meno to the Guam Housing Corporation Board of Directors. So the motion then is to go back to, to motions. Uh, any objections? No objections are ordered. Uh, Senator, we're in motions now. You may motion to place uh, the names of the individuals on the voting file. Uh, so you want me to repeat it yes. again? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, request, I'm, I'm asking then that we uh, uh, amend the session agenda to include the appointments of uh, Ms. Sandra F. Santos and Glenn A. Mr. Glenn A. Meno uh, to the Guam Housing uh, Board of Corporation Board of Directors. And the committee reports were submitted on March 18, 2013. So the, the motion then would be to add these two individuals' appointments to then the uh, voting file uh, without any objections. No objections are ordered. Thank you. Mo can you make a motion to... Okay. Uh, uh, as I indicated earlier, we do have a couple of amendments uh, being made for us to... to um, continue the discussion on um, bill number, let me see which one is it, bill number four. So we're going to take a brief recess.
legislature is uh, back in session. I'd like to recognize uh, Senator Morrison on bill number four, that's 32. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In the spirit of uh, compromise and working together, I have a few amendments to proffer to address the additional concerns uh, by the body. I understand the concerns of the body as it relates to ensuring the process of which agencies negotiating fees directly with each other for service to be open and transparent. I do appreciate the AAA process as I have administered this process several times uh, in the past. So I have a, a great appreciation for this process. And so nevertheless, uh, since it's not specific in the AAA uh, law, which fees uh, between agencies use this process and concerns, and how these fees may impact agencies. Again, in the spirit of compromise, I, I propose an amendment that will, uh, so to speak, mirror the AAA process. And I don't know if everybody has a copy of the, the amendment. On page 19, line 10, strike prior to, strike prior AAL amendment, such schedule any fees to such schedule must be approved by Imagalao in Guahan. and replace it with the fee schedule and any future changes to the fee schedule shall be subject to the approval by resolution of the Leslur and Guahan after the following conditions are met. At least one public hearing for the effect affected agencies on the fee schedules by the Office of Technology pursuant to chapter 10 of 5 GCA and B, a su submission of fee schedule schedule to the legislature in Guahan inclusive of the minutes of such hearings on scheduled fees. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay, <clears throat> I'll make sure I get this straight. On page 19, on lines 10 to 11, to delete the words starting with such schedule and any changes of, to such schedules must be approved by Magaline Guahan and submitted to the legislature via, via the AAA, the double uh, administrative adjudication law, to be now uh, replaced with this new language. That's correct, Madam Okay. Speaker. Does everybody uh, have a copy of the amendment? On the amendment, Anyone? Senator Duenas, should recognize. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity to address this very important amendment. Madam Speaker, as the debate course, rightly so, went forward on really the effect of the cost across the government in terms of the technical services provided by Bureau of Information Technology and of course the need of those services across the entire government and the importance of understanding and making sure that those services are available. I believe the argument continues to be and as, as as pointed out in this amendment, 
that there, there needs to be oversight. But there also needs to be a reasonable mechanism by which we have that oversight. And that's the power of this body. The power of this body to appropriate a budget. The power of every committee member and committee chair to hold round tables, oversights, write letters, work with the administration to ensure that there's no undue charges or fees within the government as a whole to provide these very vital services. You know, I use this example, Madam Speaker, because I think it's correct and, and appropriate. Because I was up there. There's no way in the world DYA has a budget to appropriate thousands of dollars for the maintenance of their MIS system. The library was brought up on this very floor and other, other institutions such as that. But there are, of course, your Department of Administration, your Department of Land Management, Rev and Tax, all of these institutions which generate revenue. But I can tell you this, even without the iteration of this bill right now, I never had problems with DOA in terms of getting their representatives to come up and make sure we were up and running, the vital services being provided to support all of the needs of the department to be in contact with the federal agencies via email and, and important abilities to do online filing of grant requirements and, and all the number of and the myriad of things that has to be done on a technological level at a line agency of the government of Guam that doesn't have or charge for its services and doesn't have the resources to do that. So I understand the, 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 the thought process. But it is the very ability to go beyond that and, and with this institution, this, this structure that's been put in place to charge for services to avail themselves of the additional resources to do that, to provide those services to those agencies that can afford it. But once again, Madam Speaker, as I close, it is our responsibility too to make sure that DYA and the library and, and mental health and other agencies that, that, that that need these services, that, that, that we hold this director and this institution accountable saying those places need to be paid attention to just as much as those others who have the ability and generate the revenue to be able to procure these services. I just believe that. It's fundamental. And, and by this creation and by holding a director accountable and the organization accountable, that's our power. That's inherent to this body. To say there should be no disparity on a line agency that generates no revenue to those that have a land survey revolving fund and other means by which to collect revenue to procure these services. So I believe this is a very appropriate, a very good measure, and a measure that doesn't put in an added cumbersome process by which a member of the public who probably doesn't even have a stake in the game can say, no, I want to make sure DYA only pays $1,000 a year for that service. And it's, it just becomes impractical. So Madam Speaker, I, I, I rise in full support of the amendment. And I think it takes care of both concerns. So thank you for the opportunity to speak on the amendment, Madam Speaker. You're welcome. On the amendment, Century Special, you recognize. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this is uh, on the amendment to provide that the fee schedule and any future changes to this fee schedule be adopted by the legislature through resolution. Well, I rise as a, um, a, a matter of concern, Madam Speaker, that the manner in which these uh, fees uh, are adopted uh, is not done by way of this amendment that's uh, being offered. Uh, as we know, fees are adopted through the AAA process where that in the agency that wants to provide for a fee schedule for the services that they offer to the public, or in this case, offer to a, another um, agency, a department or agency, they would have to have a public hearing on this proposed regulation. 
after which they would have to uh, decide whether or not it's still in the public's interest based on the public input. Uh, and if they decided to go forward, then they would have to get the governor's uh, uh, concurrence and the governor would have to transmit that uh, to the legislature. Uh, and, and so the, the legislature has uh, an opportunity to review uh, whether or not that fee schedule shall be implemented. If the legislature uh, does not agree at that point, then you know that we, we move to reject those AAAs and if we don't act on it, then it becomes uh, approved. But the amendment is basically saying that the legislature shall approve uh, the fee schedules by adoption of a resolution. I would imagine that I don't understand why the mover of this amendment is not just agreeing with your amendment that says that fee schedules uh, have to be adopted through the AAA process because we're accomplishing the same thing. Although I'm rising to a point of concern because we do not adopt fee schedules by way of resolution. We don't. And let's say this amendment were to pass, uh, Madam Speaker and colleagues, would that then mean that uh, we would still ultimately have to have a public hearing on the resolution. We would still have to hear from the public whether or not, or that agency, whether or not they agree with the fee schedule. And we'd also have to recognize that these would have uh, very obvious implications on the budget process and how uh, one agency being charged a fee for this service would have to be incorporated into the budget and how the legislature would have to ultimately uh, reconcile uh, those budgetary needs. And so I. I know the mover said that this amendment is being offered as a matter of compromise, but I just, uh, I just ask for his uh, reconsideration, Madam Speaker, because this amendment is really asking us to do something that's unorthodox and to do uh, things that we don't customarily do uh, when we address the rules and regulations through the AAA process. So I rise in objection to the amendment. On the amendment, is there anybody else who'd like to speak? So, Senator, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I appreciate the the input by my colleague, and it's yes, it's it's clear uh, what the AAA process uh, and the items listed and what every agency has to go through as far as how we charge a, a fee uh, that may have an impact on the general public and there's no provisions there specific to to uh, uh, to how we address agencies through agencies so as I stated it's a matter of compromise and, and, and as as respect to uh, the openness of this government and transparency with our people uh, it was a w mechanism and a way to allow for the process to have some type of public uh, input. But until we could figure out how we may have to uh, address that AAA process to incorporate into this, then uh, it makes it even more a difficult challenge for even this agency to, to charge these fees. As stated earlier by one of my colleagues is how this public input or testimony apply to agency to agency if they're negotiating a fee. This can't be a flat fee overall to every agency. One agency may require more of an extensive service. And we're not dealing with a parks permit or a, a registration or something that's a flat fee for the general public. Every agency has different needs. And, and, and I believe this amendment, Madam Speaker, allows for flexibility within the agencies that we already that already occurs uh, through different MOUs uh, uh, as such the services is needed and m uh, require more services uh, to different uh, agencies. So Madam Speaker, I do uh, respect the, my colleagues' uh, concerns, but I ask for support of the body for this amendment and that uh, we move forward. Thank you. Please state your point. I'm, Madam Speaker, I'm just concerned because the the resolu I mean the bill amendment um, provides for um, a new procedure to be done by approval of resolution, and if I'm not mistaken, present le uh, law today 
says that if any government entity wants to change fees, uh, you either uh, do the AAA process or come back to the legislature by legislative form. And, and I'm saying, wouldn't it be easier just to say, do the AAA process? I haven't gone through the bill in its entirety right now, and I apologize. I just, I just, I'm just pointing that as a point of inquiry to saying, isn't that the law exists today to go through the AAA process? Um, or, or is it because this is a new entity that we're incorporating it into this new, into this new entity, this new, uh, this new bureau? Take uh, a two-minute well, break. Okay. Uh, the, I, I, we need to read the, um, the um, amend. I mean, the original language that is being implement, uh, being uh, proffered as an amendment to it. Can, can we take a one minute recess just so that we can ask legal counsel, please? Okay, but as just want to make sure that the way it was read is that it must be approved by Imagatla in Guahan and e-legislatura pursuant to the AAA process. That's the amendment that was made and passed and this is an amendment now proffered by Senator um, <clears throat> Morrison uh, to okay yeah so uh, can do you <coughs> can we just have a one minute recess we're going to take a, a minute recess. for technical
The legislature is back in session. Uh, Senator, um, bef before I allow Senator Morrison to close, I understand then going back to a concern by another member, Senator Respicio, um, who may possibly want to amend the yeah. amendment. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you too to our good colleague, Senator Morrison, uh, in wanting to further work through uh, this amendment that he's proposing. So I offer um, this amendment, and I want to make an amendment. Uh, First of all, we remove the strike through uh, where it says such schedule and any changes to such schedule must be approved by the by Magalan Guan. So I just move that we we don't uh, we want to preserve those words in the current bill. So I move to amend his amendment. Let's bifurcate it. So the first amendment would be to delete um, such schedule and any changes to such schedule must be approved by. Himagalayan Guahan. So that when we do this, the original bill would reflect that this fee schedule must first be approved by the governor. Point of order, Madam Speaker? Uh, yes. I, I think we've come order. to an agreement here. So could, could, wouldn't he have to withdraw his objection first to clean up the amendment and see if we can take the amendment intact? No, well, no, not necessarily, because that's what he's trying to do now is to then, in, in, in essence, is to fix it so that he will not then end up objecting. So we'll have but the objection continue to stand until we... No, no, because then he's going to... No, no, to if you agree to this, then I won't object. Okay, good enough. Yeah. So you will withdraw it if we agree to this. Yeah. Okay, okay. Th th thank you, Madam you Speaker. <laughs> All right. Thank but, you, Madam Speaker. But uh, what, what needs to be clear here, because it's not written in your individual, if you didn't write the amendment, but this is what I want, I started to, to read. The amendment, amend, this, the words that are stricken out here does not have the rest of that sentence. Because at the end of Guahan, it says, and, so it means the approval is by Magatlain Guahan and e legislatura pursuant to the AAA process. That's the amendment that passed. So now once, now once we get that straight now, Senator Respicio, because I know you want to remove again the words that have stricken this to restore that language, however, you Remove must those words at the end, you're Okay, right. so that's yeah. what I wanted to, yeah. to be Thank clear. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay. So, and so we would delete <clears throat> the words and approval by Lesser to and Guahan through the subject to the AAA process. Okay, so now, I want this to be very clear for everybody. One, the, the amendment he's making is to remove the strike out on what you have written in the amendment, originally to be taken out, but that's gonna be restored, but only to, and to delete an e legislature pursuant to AAA process. Is that clear? Is that clear with everybody? Okay, so on that amendment, without any objections, so ordered. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And so my next amendment is where <coughs> Senator Morrison is saying and replace with uh, to simply remove the two words, resolution of. And so it would read, the fee schedule and any future changes to the fee schedule shall be subject to approval by Les Return Guahan after the following conditions are met. Then we want to preserve Senator Morrison's uh, original uh, intent here, uh, but we also want to make clear that the legislature would have to approve this by the same way we, uh, we, we uh, deliberate on a bill, we pass it, and then ultimately the governor would be able to uh, sign or veto, so it also preserves the spirit of checks and balances. So the <coughs> amendment then is to delete the words resolution off, and it should read then that the schedule shall be subject to approval by e legislature in Guahan. Is that clear with everybody? On that amendment without any objections? Senator Ada, do you? So maybe, Senate, so Senator, may I, can I request 
Centenary Speech Show, then as may, can I request that in your reason in terms of the, re the to strike off resolution off, if they can explain a little bit yeah. more how this is not, it's similar to, but not quite that of yeah, the So AAA. again, Madam Speaker, if my second amendment carries, uh, building upon the <coughs> first amendment, which carried, will say that the governor still has to approve the fee schedule uh, transmitted to the legislature, and then the legislature will have to act on this fee schedule the way we act on uh, bills before us. And so if the legislature agrees to that fee schedule, uh, then the governor will still have the opportunity to take action on that bill by either signing it or vetoing it. Now, what Senator Tom had asked, then if this were to pass, would then uh, the default to approval uh, conditions apply? And I don't think it will because we're not doing this through the AAA process. So on the uh, amendment, the second amendment, which is the, the deletion of two words, resolution off. Any objections? Objections to order. And then lastly, uh, Madam Speaker, I would draw my objections to the amendment as amended. So then, thank you very much, Senator. No objections to the withdrawal of his objections, order. Uh, Senator Morrison, what we're going to need then is that uh, since we are, we, I'll need for you to change the, the top portion and to show that these, uh, the sentence is, is restored and that, and this has to be submitted to legal counsel, I mean to uh, the clerk. All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand you have a second amendment. Yes, Madam Speaker. Add an uh, amendment, Madam Speaker, uh, on page 5, line 16, after the word accountability. That the ideal candidate for this position will have at least five years of senior managerial experience. I'm sorry, uh, may, may I interrupt for a moment? I was more concerned about trying to get the um, correct language to the clerk. What? And, and we, we did this, we bifurcated both of them. So what we're going to do now as a whole then is with the approval or if there's any objection now to uh, the, the whole amendment, not of it individually. Oh, okay. So, all right, so we're, you're, we're still then um, prior to that. So uh, Senator Tom Adda, then you're recognized on the amendment that has been amended. I, I just want to follow up then with the previous amendment wherein we restored the language that uh, such schedule and any changes to the such schedule must be approved by the, the governor, Imagalai and Guan. But I think we need to add to that that then after the governor approves this schedule and the fees, that then it's to be trans, but it's subject to the approval of the legislature. So it kind of leaves the question of, so how does it get transmitted down here? Does, does, he trans, does the governor transmit it in bill form? and then he'll say at the request of the governor and then we act on it or does he just send it down here with a transmittal memo and then we try and figure out who's going to be the sponsor of the bill so i would then make the amendment that um, to add the language on the second line there after imagalahin guahan and transmit it to the legislature in bill form period On the uh, ADA amendment, any objections? No objections, order. Okay, so now on the, the whole amendment that has been amended, uh, are there any objections? No objections, order. Senator Morrison. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to resume, I was on page five, line 16, after the word accountability. It should read, the ideal candidate for this position will have at least five years of senior managerial experience in a large parentheses, gener generally with revenues in excess of $100 million, company, company or governmental agency, 
in the field of information technology, management information systems, financial information systems, or closely related field. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the amendment, the sen oh, I'm sorry. Uh, do you want to speak a little bit more other than? No. no okay. No, ma'am. Right, so, Senator uh, Tom Adda. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, if the author would yield on this amendment here. Now, we're saying that the ideal candidate for this position will have at least. So, um, it's not clear if we're saying that the qualification requirement I mean, I think it's quite different to say that the qualification requirement for this position shall be a person who has at least at least five years of senior managerial experience um, in you know in a large, generally with revenues in excess of 100 million dollars. I, I this is kind of fuzzy. So we're just saying here's what an ideal candidate looks like, but we're not necessarily saying that the that the person that fills that position, that that's a uh, eligibility requirement uh, to be considered for the position. So maybe then if the author of the amendment can further clarify, uh, because I know that, for example, in the, in the enabling act of, let's say, the Guam Power Authority, it says very clearly that the general manager must have the, follow must have the following qualifications must have an engineering degree, must have um, uh, at least, uh, must have a professional engineering uh, registration, must have this, must have that. So if you don't meet any of these, you're not qualified, you're out of the running. But the way this is written, it just simply says, here's what an ideal candidate looks like, but it doesn't say that that's what a candidate mm -hmm. has to have. Senator, do you yield to the question? Yes, Madam Speaker. I, I appreciate my colleagues' concerns on that. On, on, on page five, it addresses exactly what this question is, and it spells out uh, what the chief technology officer sh shall have. And what this amendment does is it's basically telling us what the ideal candidate would be. I do agree that maybe we, we can word it to qualification uh, for this position, but what we're saying here is what what the individual or this position uh, must have as far as five years uh, the company. But in page five, Madam Speaker, you can see where it ex explains it basically or answers this question, hopefully, of uh, that he shall have the knowledge in the field of information technology, experience in the design of management information systems, and understanding of the special demands upon the government with respect to budgetary constraints the protection of privacy, interests, and federal and local standards accountability. So what we're doing here, Madam Speaker, again, is, is kind of defining the, the ideal candidate, but uh, I do uh, uh, respect the, that the, the change of a qualification uh, instead of ideal candidate, uh, we can work with that. Senator Tom Mehta, uh, was he able to answer your question? So, so basically what we're saying is that it's really not a, an eligibility requirement for consideration. I mean, I guess it'd be nice if you have this five years of senior experience with a company in, uh, in a large company. Uh, I, I, that's what I gather from, from what was said. So if, if that was what was meant, then this just kind of describes what the ideal candidate is. Otherwise, it really could be somebody who's just got two years of experience, and I like you. Do you, do you want to amend it then by changing the word will to must? Well, um, nothing. We're creating something totally new. No, but it says the ideal candidate. It, you I want mean, to take a brief recess? Yeah. Well, the other, the other part, before we even do that, and I have concern about the fact that uh, this, this candidate, not, not only must he have five years of senior managerial experience, it must be in a large company, uh, generally with revenues in excess of $100 million. That pretty much rules out any candidate from Guam. Yes, the Department of Education. Well, just to clear <laughs> that up. The entire government of Guam. 
Thanks. Madam Speaker, um, I think our. our <clears throat> so uh, why don't we take a brief recess?
the legislature is back in session. Uh, Senator Ada, you've relinquished then now uh, the mic. So Senator Mike, so Nicholas, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate the sharp eye of Senator Ada, and I would like to proffer an amendment to the amendment. You may uh, proceed. Um, after consultation with the author of the amendment and the author of the bill, um, we're going to make some adjustments to the language as originally proposed in, in his amendment. And my amendment is first to strike the word ideal. On that amendment, then to strike the word ideal, no objection, so ordered. Second Amendment, Madam Speaker, is to strike the word will after the word position and replace it with the word shall. On that amendment, without any objection, so ordered. The next amendment, and this is going to get a little tricky, so um, please bear with me and guide me if you need me to, or if you need to, but after the word experience, managerial experience, after that word, the remainder of words from the starting with the word in, and ending with the word agency I apologize madam speaker let me let me let me pull that back we're just going to strike the words from from the word experience we're going to strike from in to agency just a straight strike okay on the amendment is to strike the words after experience starting with in all the way to the second line ending with agency so it should read manager experience in the field of on that amendment any objections no objections so ordered and then at the end of the original language where the period is after the word field we're going to change the period to a comma and insert new language continue and the new language will read, in a company or a governmental agency, with revenues in excess of $10 million, period. So on the amendment then that after the word field, add the words comma, in a company or governmental agency, comma, with revenues in excess of $10 million. Yes, Madam Speaker. Has, and so the final language after all the amendments will read, the ideal candidate for this position shall have at least five years of senior managerial experience in the field of information technology, management information systems, financial information systems, or closely related field in a company or governmental agency with revenues in excess of $10 million. Thank you, Senator. So on that last amendment, no objections, so ordered. Senator, please make sure that the clerk has a copy of uh, your amendments. So on, um, I'm sorry, yes, so on the amendment now that was, uh, Right. As passed, as amended, yes. So I, I just, I just have a question of the, you know, uh, we have here requiring then shall have at least five years of senior managerial experience. Now, I think with that adjective in there, we're going to be splitting hairs, you know. So, senior versus middle management versus, you know, as opposed to just five years of managerial experience, uh, should probably suffice, and should we should probably strike out the the term senior because that that could be a, um, a a difficult thing to to define okay. on the amendment no, no, on the amendment to strike the word senior no objection so ordered so on the amendment that has been amended any objections now to the full amendment you want me to read it one more time to make sure the candidate for this position must have at least five years of managerial experience. Must have. Oh, you oh, he said must. Shall. Shall have at least five years of manager experience in the field of information technology, management information systems, financial information systems, or closely related field 
and a company or governmental agency with revenues in excess of $10 million. On that amendment. No objection? So ordered. Madam Speaker. Okay, next amendment. Yes, yes, Madam Speaker. On top of uh, page 20, uh, to add a new subsection, and uh, 20, two, 20, or 20211, at the end of section 1. So I'll sh read, <coughs> shall read subsection 20211, semi annual reporting. The Chief Technology Officer shall submit a report to e -le Legislature in Guahan every six months on the activities of the Office of Technology and recommendations, if any, for changes to public law. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the amendment. No. Any, 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 ob any objections? Yeah. Uh, or recommendations? Okay. Senator Munya Barnes? No, oh, it's not a public law yet, so. So. or just end it with recommendations, period. Madam Speaker, move to delete after uh, six months on the activities of the Office of Technology and Recommendations, delete uh, comma all the way up to law and delete. And put a period. Uh, and put a period. Where the comma set. On that amendment is to delete the words, if any, for changes to public law and just end with recommendations, period. On the amendment without any objections, to order. Senator Morrison, you make you still have the floor if you want to add anything else or close. Yes, Madam Speaker, thank you. <coughs> I appreciate the contributions offered by my colleagues on before Madam Speaker and I know that uh, We've all been trying to see how we can transform this government to be more efficient, convenient, and effective for our people. I mentioned earlier that our goal is to, by we're using taxpayers' monies and how we can appropriately save taxpayers' monies in the investments of technology, or we call it trying to invest in e-government. And we've already seen some of the negative implications of not having a structured, a coordinated approach to information technology. A lot of things have prompted this and we've seen in the past the, the issues of not having that structured coordinated approach to modernizing our accounting system. And we've tried with the, the Oracle, we tried with other options, but we're back to square one every time. Um, the ability to put our taxes online, to have the electronic ability uh, the ability to see land parcels online, the ability to pay your registrations online. We always go back to square one because we do not have that structured, coordinated approach to information technology. So Madam Speaker, I thank my colleagues for all the input and I, I appreciate their wisdom and their eye for better expressing this bill. And I look forward for their support and if in the future that we can help this office uh, to better uh, serve our people. And this, I believe, Madam Speaker, is the beginning of a transformation for our government as far as efficiency, convenience, and how we can save t taxpayers' dollars. Thank you. Madam Speaker, um, I'd like to make an amendment to add co-sponsors, co to add Senator Duenas, Senator Tom Adder, Senator Mike St. Nicholas, Senator Mike Limpiaco, Senator McCready. I'm, I'm, I'm answering to the request. I'll be your number eight. Senator Respicio, everybody. <laughs> 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 
Let so me sure get this Senator right. Yamashita, thank you. Uh, to add Speaker. Senator Duenas, Senator Tom Adda, Senator Sinicola, Senator Lim Chalko, and Senator Respicio. Am I correct? Did I miss anybody on that I think, uh, amendment? Uh, Senator Sorry. Yamashita, I, I did mention it earlier, but uh, just to confirm that. Senator Yamashita. And Senator Yamashita. Anybody else? Okay. On that amendment without any objection, so we're So, okay, no, on, now, yes, on the motion, you're right, the main motion now. No, 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 we didn't. I, what I did is I did the, the uh, amendment to add uh, co-sponsors. I did not make the motion to send yet, so. Well, Senator, I would allow you to, to speak. I, I appreciate it, Madam Speaker. And the, my only concern is that as I support the intent of the bill, I, I just want to ask uh, um, a question in reference to the agencies and those involved to working closely with the Bureau of Technology. In no way do I want this Bureau of Technology to take away from the agencies their IT personnel and that was my main concern when this was being introduced and I I don't know what assurances are here I know I'm I'm late in this ball game but if I have a just based on 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 what it says and as far as the definitions on on bringing the agencies together I I really don't want it to be based on the authority of the executive branch to take away the vital, critical uh, um, le electronic brain from the agencies that have an IT in place today. Um, I do know that when we looked at the technical infrastructure and, and by means of doing this project, it was to take the expertise from all the agencies to work closely, but not to, to take away from the agencies, from the executive branch, or any of the autonomous agencies. So I guess that's my inquiry. And I, I, have, I have not, I'd ask for a minute to ask legal counsel if we can put something to that in place here. So uh, for some kind of amendment to put add in. But if he wants to answer my question, because just based on the definition, I, I do know that there's room for loopholes. And uh, may I? And, and the specific uh, page, what? I'm sorry. So, Senator, do you, will you be able, Senator Morrison, do you yield to the question? Yes, Madam Speaker. Yes. To answer my colleague's question, I, I believe Senator Yamashita uh, earlier asked that question as well, and on page nine, um, it's, it's voluntary, uh, and it, it specifically says, with respect to the executive agency, the chief technology officer of Maine, and it's, it's, it clearly, clear, clearly uh, exemplifies it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Senator Tom. I, I appreciate that response. And sometimes, Madam Speaker, the May sometimes becomes shall and indirectly and my only concern is not taking away from the criticalness of the of the uh, of the agencies that already have um it personnel there so i'm asking for i know it's 12 almost 1225 right now and i'm just asking if legal counsel can help me make an amendment to work on a provision to saying that that it's all right to borrow but not not to take. <laughs> I just need to work with her on that and, and get the legal technical uh, provisions put in place for my amendment. So if you can give me that time, I would really appreciate it. Please. Um, it, since it's 11, I'm um, 1225, it's 12 we're going to recess until two o'clock this afternoon. Sign them